Hello, and it's a great pleasure for me to be at your Champions Retreat. Uh, I'm talking to you from Vancouver, British Columbia, on a very fine, sunny spring morning. And I'd like to thank Hussein for inviting my participation in your very important uh, meeting of the minds, presuming, presuming that's what champions are. And Hossein sent me a number of questions which he thought I might be able to answer about my life with in interprofessional education over the last uh, almost uh, 30 years. And some of the issues that have arisen as we've confronted the need to change healthcare systems, health and social care systems, in ways that reflect the concerns of patients, clients, customers, whatever the word is that you use to describe those people who come for assistance. Um, I entered into professional education um, a long time ago. It was not my field of study, but it has become my field of study. I'm a linguist by background. So what have we learned um, that I think is worth sharing? Well, first of all, You've got to have a vision about what it is you want to do in interprofessional education for person-centered collaborative practice. And then having a vision, you have to be capable of inspiring other people to see that vision and then to be inspired yourself by the way in which people interact with you. And uh, I can't say that too many times. Um, this is not something that you get into and treat as though it's another bureaucratic academic exercise. So what are some of the success factors that um, we can now look at and say, hmm, if we remember this, we should be a lot more efficient and effective at collaborating across the many silos, both within the academic system and within the healthcare system. The first is to remember that interprofessional education is a definition and it has three parts. And I think it's very, very, very important to remember this definition because without recognizing it, people can say they're doing interprofessional, I put a hyphen in, which is inappropriate, um, and not really be clear that interprofessional education is actually uh, an acronym used about a continuum. And I'm sure Hossein has talked about this. Um, the official definition came from the Center for the Advancement of Interprofessional Education in the United Kingdom. It was very carefully crafted and it says occasions when members or students note that it's not just students it's members or students of two or more professions and that can be health social care learn with from and about each other very important to remember what those words are and how we exteriorize them to improve collaboration because that's why we want to learn with from and about each other and when that is said and done, to understand that we're looking <clears throat> to improve the quality of care of the people that we're trying to serve, the patients, customers, whatever. And I think it, I read a lot of approaches to interprofessional education around the world. And I'm always slightly saddened when people take the first part of the definition, learning with, from, and about, and forget that at the end of the day, the reason for doing that is that we want to improve quality of care. And there have been a number of issues that have come up that challenge us working in interprofessional education. Um, and I'm sure that you will be grappling with them. So what's the ideal site for teaching and learning about interprofessional practice and care? What's the ideal site? It's certainly not a classroom. And how do we use interprofessional competencies to facilitate curriculum reform? And I'll come to that in just a moment. And then how do we assess and evaluate the effects of interprofessional education on quality of care? Very, very important. You know, we can't compare apples and oranges with what happens when we don't understand how people are using the definition. And then how do we influence policy to affect the system change that we think should happen across education and health, the healthcare continuum. Very, very interesting issues, and we're still grappling with them, and you will grapple with them. 
And then what are some of the obstacles that uh, have proven to be very difficult to overcome, but we're, we're working at it. Well, let's just think of that, no, that definition as a null hypothesis, right? No statistic, statistical null hypotheses. You know, so you could say what we're interested in is this, this hypothesis says there's, in, there's no difference in collaboration to improve quality of care provided by health and social care professionals who are educated at the pre-licensure level to live, learn with from about each other compared with those who aren't educated that way. Okay, so what it is we're trying to do when we're doing interprofessional education is say at the end of the day, we reject the null hypothesis. That is, it does make a difference to do what it is that we're trying to do through interprofessional education and collaborative person-centered practice. And here's a major difficulty. And I don't, I don't care where you go in the world, what community you're in, changing a college curriculum is like moving a graveyard. You never know how many friends the dead have until you try to move them. And that's not unique to me, that's attributed to Calvin Coolidge. It is true, trying to change the curriculum has proven to be one of the biggest obstacles that we come across. And I suspect it's because we think of the curriculum in a very standard academic fashion, as though it's you know three hours in a classroom three times a week, or an hour in a classroom three times a week for 13 weeks in the term, or semester, or quarter, or whatever it is you're working on. And we've got to get past thinking about curriculum in those terms. And I'll come to that again in a moment. So, the, so curriculum, which drives education, has proven to be, at times, a huge obstacle when viewed through that narrow lens. Now, what about the opportunities? Well, one of the things we've learned is that it's really important to have a physical environment in which you can do this kind of work. You know, dedicated space to small group learning, case-based learning, whatever you want to call it, and then the same kind of availability of those spaces within the practice community. So that when there are students from various health social care professional professions out learning to be an X or Y or Z, you have a place in which you can put them. And another is the, the, the need to um, see the curricula as an integral part of the clinical practice culture. Right, to go back to talking about curriculum, this is where it has its best opportunity to happen. And, and that's because when we are out there, when the students are out there, they are having a lived experience with the patient, client, whatever, that they share with a practitioner who has that experience every day. So we have to build a curriculum that recognizes that interaction of the lived experience. And we have to agree on it. Everybody has to agree that, yep, that's a great way to move the curriculum forward. And we build it on competencies. So let's just think about how it is that we have moved the needle so far in the last 10 years. Um, the Canadian Interprofessional Health Collaborative, and forgive me because IPEC in the United States has a set of competencies, but we built the competencies, and so these are the ones I just talk about for a moment. What we recognize is that we need to understand very clearly um, what competencies need to be in place that are truly interprofessional. And IPEC in the United States and the Canadian Professional Health Collaborative in Canada done a lot of work on this, and it is now the focus of curriculum in, for example, McGill University, the University of Montreal, the University of Toronto. They use those, those competencies to drive the curriculum because they're so closely associated uh, with, the, um, with the practice environment. We certainly think a lot about um, case-based learning because once you move into practice, you have a wonderful opportunity to look at all kinds of cases and then to tackle things like role clarification, conflict, um, conflict resolution, collaborative leadership, team functioning, all of those things that 
we have to ensure our students have as competencies if they're going to practice interprofessionally. And one of the things that we have learned um, in spades is that we need to really develop good facilitators in the same way as we did when we were working on problem-based learning. And a preceptor is not a facilitator, a mentor is not a facilitator, a successful facilitator for IPE is somebody who understands the inter of interprofessional education and can clearly communicate the inter of interprofessional education and make sure that it's woven through the training of all of the health social care professionals. Huge task, but one that we're working on and I think we're making progress. Um, and I think we've also dis discovered that um, we have to include everybody in this activity. Um, it has to, we really have to be sure that our colleagues in the practice environment are in fact able and interested and willing and capable of being those who will lead the interprofessional charge, if you like, uh, once we get down to the place where we have to work with patients, clients, customers. Um, so some of the things that, some of the interlearning verbs that I constantly have to reiterate are, we need to recognize that networking effectively is really important. Communicating and problem solving, managing confidentiality, cooperating reflectively. Reflection is so, so important. And then cooperating and negotiating honestly. And sometimes, you know, we've learned that this doesn't come across in our teaching. And as I said, handling conflict appropriately. And one of the things that we try, we have learned and try now to ensure is that when people are planning interprofessional education programs, because it is from the beginning of training to the end of practice, when you retire, then we plan realistically. You know, don't set unreasonable expectations. And one of the ways that we've learned how to do this is to build a community of practice for IPP, interprofessional practice, and IPC, interprofessional care. So you focus on integrated interprofessional collaborative practice and care. And you invite participation of those people who are engaged in it to be part of the, com of the community of practice. Communities of practice, a great facilitatory mechanism. So success, strategies for success. Well, we know that those facilitators that are going to be so important in the practice environment have to be recruited. And you have to be careful about the recruitment. They have to be appointed and that the appointment has to be recognized as one that's about interprofessional education. They have to be prepared. Somebody has to put up faculty development programs in order to, to prepare these facilitators. And then they have to be supported, supported academically and in as many ways as possible. And of course, rewarded in some fashion for the kinds of work that they do, which is not the traditional professional training that goes on under preceptorships um, when students go out into practice to learn how to do what it is they have to do. I think that um, when we are looking to measure success, um, we really think hard about the evaluation metrics that we put in place from the beginning. And I can't say this enough times. You, you, when you start on these kinds of programs, what we've learned is you have to be sure that you have a good evaluation metric in place. You have to be able to monitor what's going on during the whole process of doing interprofessional education, monitor it and put in place some surveillance things that allow you to say, eh, we're going down the wrong path here, we need to come back. We need to be able to understand what the ways of knowing are that we are developing. What, what is it that we're putting in place that helps it helps interprofessional education all across the entire continuum to be effective? And then how and what do we learn about engagement? You know, once we get people in place, 
we have to learn, and that's through evaluation. We have to learn what is that engagement, how do we repeat it over and over again. And then at the end of the day, have always consistent quality reviews. Every four years, look at what's being done. Say, can we do better? What have we done really well? And finally, commit to sustain. This is not something you do on a Friday afternoon because it's raining in Wisconsin and you got an hour and a half. Be humble, be teachable, and always keep learning and listening. Thank you for your attention, all my relations.